Welcome to Stunt Stories. I'm Corey Eubanks. As I mentioned on my pilot podcast, I was the youngest stuntman ever employed by Warner Brothers to work on the hit television show, The Dukes of Hazard, back in 1981, and worked on that show for four years, did 87 episodes, and fulfilled a childhood dream of jumping the General Lee almost every week, sometimes two, three times a week. It was uh, like a dream come true. And then once the show was canceled, it was no longer on the air, I was invited to go back to, uh, what was it, Conyers, Georgia, to a Duke's Fest. I didn't even, didn't even know what this was. This, this guy called me out of the blue, a guy named Travis Bell, and invited me to come back there to this Duke's Fest. Because when he first called me, he said, Are you, is this Corey Eubanks? I said, yeah, yeah, this is Corey. Who, who's this? Because my name's Travis Bell. He goes, are you the Corey Eubanks that worked on the Dukes of Hazard TV show? And I said, yes, I am. He goes, well, I'd like to invite you to come back to this, this Dukes Fest and, and meet some of the fans of, of you know, the Dukes of Hazard and of the General Lee. And I said, they're not going to want to meet me. That's going to be a waste of time. And, and it, it's, I, I'm flattered. But he goes, oh, no, 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 no. They want to meet the stuntmen that worked on the show. So I, I accepted the offer and they uh, flew me back there and I met these fans and I don't know, there was probably 7,500 people there. It was, it was a pretty good turnout that, you know, and they had the actors from the show were there, you know, John Schneider and Tom Wopat, Kathy Bach was there and James Best and all, all the other guys that were in, in the show and I was blown away. I had no idea that there were actually fans uh, and they'd all get together. I mean, the show had been off the air for quite a while when, when this had happened. Uh, I think that was in 2002. So I mentioned to Travis Bell as at the end of the convention, um, I said, hey, if you ever decide to do this again and, you know, if you want to do this again, let me know and I'll come out and jump the General Lee for you. Really give him something to talk about. And he looked at me with this blank look like, are you crazy? He said, can you, can you really do that? I said, sure. I'll get a hold of Tommy Semeno, who is the head mechanic on the show, and we can build a General Lee, and we got the specs for the jump ramps, and we can come jump it. So he went ahead and moved forward with that idea, and now it falls on the 25th anniversary of the General Lee's first uh, appearance doing the jump. And we go back to... Uh, Conyers, Georgia, where they had shot the pilot. And I'd end up jumping the General Lee in front of a live audience. Uh, there was a lot of people there. I'm not exactly sure on the head count, but I would guess between 10 and 15,000 people showed up for me to, to watch me jump this General Lee and also meet the stars as well. But this was a big deal because I was actually um, bringing the General Lee out of retirement. This was the first time ever the General Lee had been jumped off of the set of the Dukes of Hazard. That uh, this was a first time occurrence. This was like a, a new thing. And and oddly enough, <clears throat> excuse me, oddly enough on that day that I jumped that General Lee, it was the same day that a gentleman named Skip Ward had passed away. And Skip Ward was the line producer of the Dukes of Hazard, And Rod Amato had passed away. That was the gentleman who wrote the pilot for the show. And I'm kind of going, wow, this is kind of tripping me out. Because I believe it was Kathy Bach who told me. She was very upset that um, these, these two gentlemen had passed away. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, things happen in threes, you know. <laughs> Uh, is this a bad idea kind of to be jumping the General Lee uh, not on the Dukes of Hazard TV show? It was kind of weird. Uh, we didn't have weights for the trunk of the vehicle. Normally we would put, you know, 350 to up to 450 pounds of weight, lead weights in the trunk of the car. We didn't have the lead weights. Um, I wasn't too concerned about that. I knew I knew the car was going to just do, a, you know, like a big lawn dart and just, you know, nosedive into the into the grass um, but it was a unibody and it, it, it's like crushing a beer can. It's just going to absorb all the impact. It wasn't going to be, um, you know, much of a, of an impact for me. 
Um, because you know, we typically we, we use a, a jump vest because we the weight in the back of the car is to make the vehicle land more flat. And with that car with the General Lee, the 69 Dodge Charger, there's not much suspension. You bottom out real easily. And so to to um, keep you from compressing your vertebrae in your back, we wore these jump vests that had D rings behind stitched into the jump vest um, behind your, sh- your, your shoulder blades. And we would have bungee cord through some quick releases and the bungee cord, this three quarter inch bungee cord would go up over the roll bar and then connect to these quick releases that you would snap into your D rings. So your, your, your ass is kind of floating up off the, off the seat about three to five inches. And then you'd put on your five point harness and snug yourself down and your shoulder shoulder harnesses to hold yourself back but you were kind of like in a spider web you're kind of like suspended there but when the vehicle would fly through the air and you would squeeze your lats and you would tuck your chin into your neck collar like putting your chin down against your chest and and you used to call it riding the bungee you would you didn't want that vest to slip up underneath your armpits you wanted to squeeze really tight with your thumbs out on the steering wheel and so when it landed that bungee cord was stretching. It was keeping you from getting compression in your in your vertebrae. And it worked really well. It worked very, very well. And a matter of fact, my back is is fine. I've never injured my back from doing vehicular jumps because I've always used that jump vest system that was um, invented on the Dukes of Hazard TV show by a gentleman named Jerry Summers and Bob Orison. The two of them came up with that concept. And back in the day on the show, they used to just loop that three-quarter inch bungee cord through the D-ring and around the roll bar and tie it into a knot, which was you're you're committed. You're committed to being inside the vehicle, whether it turned upside down and rolled down into a ditch or caught on fire. You're not getting out of that vehicle, even though you've released your five-point harness. You're not going to be able to climb out until someone comes with a knife and cuts that bungee cord. And that concerned me. So it was actually my idea to get these quick releases so that you could get hit your five-point, release that, kind of pop up out of the seat a little bit from the bungee cord, and then hit your two re- your quick releases to be able to escape out of the car. And, and that, that modification, I'm kind of proud of that I was able to contribute to that, that technique and that system to uh, increase the safety of, of jumping the General Lee. But anyway, at this convention afterwards, uh, there was a, uh, a conference room and we had this questions and answers uh, thing for all the fans. There was like, I don't know, maybe close to a thousand people in this room that wanted to ask the stunt guys about uh, stunts that we've done on the show and what was it like. And, and gosh, there was Gary Baxley was there and Al Wyatt Jr. who has no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, Al Wyatt Jr. Just, I, you will hear me talk a lot about Alan Wyatt Jr. He has driven the General Lee more than any man on the face of the earth and has inspired so many uh, professional stunt drivers because of his style, his way of, of sliding that General Lee and power sliding through those, those dirt roads and pitching it sideways. And, and very few people know, very few people know that he was doing that wearing shorts and flip-flops. Those were his stunt school, uh, his stunt shoes. He would wear flip-flops. I kid you not. And <laughs> just the finesse that, I, I'm so blessed to be able to sit as his passenger and watch this man uh, handle when, the steering wheel and when he would engage the emergency brake to lock up the rear tires to pitch the vehicle and when he would get on the accelerator and just that feel that you would get from that, that, that momentum and watching him handle the steering wheel and when he what angles he would come into a turn and when he'd be on the throttle and when he'd get off the throttle and so much of that feel... Um, I learned, I absorbed from riding in the, in the General Lee as his passenger. And I'm so blessed because it really helped me out immensely in my, in my stunt driving career. Um, great guy. I uh, so sad that he's no longer with us. Al Wyatt Jr. What a remarkable human being he was. And, and he was, as I said, he was there at that night and 
Henry Kinji was there, and Bob Orison was there, and Russell Solberg was there, who was John Schneider's full figure stunt double, and also jumped the General Lee many, many times. And the head mechanic of the show, Tommy Sarmento, uh, there would not have been a Dukes of Hazard TV series without that man fixing all the cars that we we broke almost every day. I think I hold the record for the most uh, cars broken in one day. I think I broke seven General Lees in one day. It was just one of those days that things went wrong. I mean, I'd jump in another General Lee and throw it in drive, go to take off, and the drive shaft would break. You know, it was just, <laughs> just things would go. I'd take it down through a ditch and up the other side, and the radiator would bust out. So, I mean, they were old cars. They, they broke pretty eas- easily. But if it wasn't for Tommy Cemento uh, stitching them back together, rebuilding them, uh, that series never would have, would have survived as, as long as it did. So Tommy was there to answer questions for fans. And they were coming down, the, down this line, this table, where everyone was in front of a microphone. <clears throat> and by the time they got down to me, I was asked by this one gentleman, he says, hey, Corey, what was it like for you the very first time you drove the General Lee? And I said to myself, okay, well, um, I will just tell him the truth. And I said, it was a full moon. And he goes, a full moon? There, there was never an episode of the Dukes of Hazard that was at night, was there? And I said, I didn't say it was on the television show. You asked me when, what was it like the very first time I drove the General Lee, and I said there was a full moon, and it was in the middle of the night, and the room got silent. And I said, um, it's kind of a long story, but uh, there's this crazy friend of mine <laughs> in high school named Willie Donahue, and he called me one night. I go, I was, you know, I think the 11th or 12th grade in high school, And he said to me, and when he called me at one o'clock in the morning, and he said, hey, Corey, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing, Willie? I was sound asleep, and now I had to answer the phone because you're calling me at one o'clock in the morning. And he said, he goes, hey, I think I know where they filmed the Dukes of Hazzard. And I said, that's great, Willie. That's awesome. what, what, What are you getting at? Why are you telling me this? He goes, why don't we go out to where they, they film and see if we can't find that General Lee? I go and do what? He goes, I don't know. Let's climb inside of it. Let's just go. Let's just go touch it. Let's be able to tell everybody, hey, we touched the General Lee. And I said, that's a brilliant idea. I'm gonna come get you. So I jumped in my Land Cruiser. I had a 1975 Toyota Land Cruiser when I was in high school, and I drove to Willie's house, picked him up, and we drove north on the 101 freeway. And he goes, yeah, yeah. My brother said he was following this car carrier and had a General Lee on it and a couple police cars and and it got off at Westlake Boulevard and made a left. I go, that's it? That's our lead? Get off at Westlake Boulevard and make a left? He goes, yeah. So that's what we did. And we drove and drove and drove and went up this canyon, windy canyon road. And I'm thinking, this is a wild goose chase. We're never going to find. He goes, yeah, he, he, my brother said he followed it up some road. I think, yeah, it was a windy road, he said. And then there were these two gates that drove through these gates and that's that you know he turned around and went back and so we kept driving and i was just about to say willie this is dumb we're, we're on the wrong road and we went over this little bridge and went a little bit further and on the right hand side there were these two gates with barbed wire across the top and a sign that said no trespassing but to me to us that sign said come on in <laughs> you're here you know welcome Open the gate. That's what those signs said. So we parked my Land Cruiser and we go, but the gates were locked. And we're like, oh man, what do we do now? And I'm like, hey, let me move my Land Cruiser a little bit closer to the fence. We could climb up on the rooftop and I think we can get up over this fence. So that's what we did. We climbed up on my rooftop and climbed up over the barbed wire and tried not to get, you know, stuck by those barbs and drop down to the ground and we start hiking. I don't know, maybe 20 minutes to a half hour going through the sagebrush and going up one hill and down over another and kind of following this dirt road in the canyon that's winding back further, further, further into this, into the, into the hills. 
And we come to the edge of this, at the top of this hill, and we look down into the canyon, and it was like a sea of orange. There were all of these General Lees, not one. There was like 25 or 30. And that's when it first hit us. Like, Wait a minute. You mean to tell me there's more than one General Lee? Because like, like you, I, I watching the TV show, I just assumed there was one, one General Lee. I didn't know there was like 25 or 30 of them. Could not believe it. I was seen. And then parked amongst them, there were maybe 20 or 25 Roscoe and Enos patrol cars. There was a couple of Boss Hog Cadillacs. There was a couple of Uncle Jesse pickup trucks, two or three Daisy Duke Jeeps. And then way off in the distance, several hundred yards away, by the barn, under these oak trees, there was a motorhome with a porch light on. And parked in front of that motorhome was another Jeep, not a Daisy Jeep, just this brown Jeep. And I'm like, oh, Willie, look, that must be the security guard guy. They got a security guard out here watching these these vehicles. This is not a good idea. And Willie goes, let's just go down and touch it. Come on, Corey, they're right there. Let's just go down and touch one. So we hike down this hillside, and we approach these General Lees, and I just pick one. I just walk up to the, the one I, I was gravitated toward. And I said, Willie, what do you bet these doors aren't, lock, aren't welded shut? He goes, oh, no, no, they are. That's why they have to always climb in through the windows. And I go, ah, I don't know. I think that's just Hollywood bullshit. And sure enough, I go and I grab the first door and, I op and it opens right up. I go, see, all that time Bo and Luke climbing through the windows, that was all for nothing. These doors opened up just fine. <laughs> and I climb in and shut the door. And there I am sitting inside the General Lee. And I'm like, checking it all out and Willie climbs in the passenger side and we're sitting there like Bo and Luke Duke because coincidentally I had I had brown hair and Willie had blonde hair and we're sitting there just kind of checking it out and a, a little to be honest with you a little disappointed with the the um, condition of the interior all dusty and seats were torn and you know things were broken on the dash and we're just kind of touching and feeling I'm holding the steering wheel kind of imagining what it would be like to drive it and this is really cool, man. We're not just touching the General Lee. We're sitting inside the General Lee. And as I'm touching and feeling everything, I reach up for some reason and I just kind of tug on the visor. And this key slips off the visor and lands right in my lap. And like I mentioned, it was a full moon that night. And the moonlight was reflecting off of this key. I mean, it looked like a shot from a Steven Spielberg movie. I swear to you, I almost heard music just illuminating this key, just like it was a magical moment. And I look over at Willie, and he's looking down at the key. And he looks at me. I'm like, oh, my God. He knows there's a key on my lap that's got to be to the General Lee. It's got to be to this car. He knows that I know it's there. I can't pretend like it. I don't know. And so what do you do? What would you have done? I did what any young man would, would do if the key to the General Lee fell and landed in your lap. I picked it up and I put it in the ignition and I could not start the car. I could not not start the General Lee. I couldn't let Willie go back to high school and tell everybody, yeah, Corey had the key right in his hand and he didn't start the General Lee. So I cranked the key and part of me was hoping that maybe the battery was dead and it wouldn't start. And because if it starts, what's that going to lead to? And, <laughs> and then maybe it's out of gas. I don't know. And, but nope, you know, Tommy Cemento, he had those cars running. I mean, tip top shape, always tuned up, ready to go. This 440 started right up on the first click. Brrr, it starts up. So I start pumping the accelerator and listening to revving it and going like, oh, that's cool, man. You know, rawr, rawr. maybe that'll be enough to make Willie happy that, hey, we didn't just come out and touch the General Lee. We climbed in it and started the engine and we revved it up really loud. Nope. Willie's like, let's go for a drive. Put, Come on, Corey, let's go for a drive. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. And I throw this thing in drive and I'm like, Shh, let's go for it. And I just stomp on the accelerator. And we take off, and I almost hit one of the J Daisy Jeeps and 
started doing some donuts in this little opening in between where the Uncle Jesse pickup trucks were. There was like this big dirt area, and I just started doing donuts, and I didn't have my seatbelt on, so I'm falling into Willie. He's pushing me back, so I spin the car the other way so I could lean up against the, the driver's side door and doing these donuts and just, I mean, it was it was fun. And through the dust, suddenly, we see these headlights approaching. And I'm like, oh, my God. We woke the security guard guy up, and here he comes. What do we do? So my instincts were to run, to take off, just to gas it and go. And I took off down this dirt road. And we're going. I'm trying to hit the headlights on the General Lee. But, hey, just so you know, FYI, if you ever try to go to steal a General Lee, the drive in the middle of the night the headlights don't work they never worked so they don't work and i'm like oh shit they don't work there's no headlights and i'm driving but it was like i said the moonlight it was it was bright enough i didn't really need headlights but i saw that these the road fork one it went off to the right and then it went straight up this hill and i just chose to go straight and we're going up this hill full throttle i mean going up this hill and as we reach the top of the hill I can't see over the other side. And I'm thinking, I don't know what's on the other side. Is it a cliff? I don't know. So I'm like, my instincts were to jump out. So I look at Willie and I said, Willie, jump out. And he goes, what? I go, jump out. And I open my door and he opens his door and we both bail. We just dive out of this General Lee that's going like maybe 20 or 25 miles an hour towards the top of this hill. And as we roll through the sagebrush and the weeds and we we pop up and we could see it disappear over the side and we could hear it. We run up to the top of the hill and we could hear it crashing through the sagebrush and we get up to the top and we look down in this canyon and there's this huge oak tree and it's lined up perfectly with this oak tree and it just crashes into it. <laughs> and we're like, oh my God, we killed the General Lee. Let's get out of here. And we just start hauling butt back towards my... Land Cruiser, which was like maybe a quarter mile. I mean, we hiked a long way up this canyon to where the where all the picture vehicles were parked. Running, 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 and get all the way. Finally, you know, adrenaline just pumping through your veins, and we're so tired, and we get back to the chain link fence. We climb up to the top, and the barbed wire's snagging your pants and tearing your shirt, and we drop down on the rooftop in my Land Cruiser, jump inside, and just haul ass out of there. So now it's maybe six or seven months later and it's when my dad got me the job to work on the television show by calling the executive producer this is a story i told him my podcast pilot and they had the the second assistant director call me see that back in the day they would call you because we didn't have smartphones. They couldn't send you an email or a text message how to get to location. They would actually call you on a telephone and give you directions. And this second assistant director had called me to give me directions on how to get out to the set. And I said, oh, no, I, I, I know how to get there. I, I, I know where you guys film. <laughs> I didn't tell them how I knew, but that's, that's, uh, I, I knew how to get out there. But... Uh, at this at this convention, at this questions and answers, when I told this story um, about that night, my first time experience driving the General Lee, as I was telling the story, I could feel the gaze, the stare from Tommy Cemento at the end of the tables. I could feel his eyes just like stabbing me in the side of the head. And with this look on his face, he was like, in shock. It was a mixture of shock and, and anger. And at the end of my story, he goes, that was you? You are the one who stole the General Lee? And I'm like, uh, I'm not really sure what your definition is of stealing because I didn't take it off of the property. Had I gone outside the gates, maybe we could say, okay, Corey, you stole the General Lee. But I think I really, I just t- took it for a joyride. And he goes, because of you, Warner Brothers then made it mandatory that I had to take out every single key of every picture vehicle and lock it up in a lockbox every night because of you. And I'm like, um, I'm, 
I'm sorry. I don't, what, what do you want me to say? It's like, you know, it's 25 years later, Tommy, get over it. But he's, he's, uh, he's like, oh my God. And I, and I asked him, did you guys ever find the car? Because as I was working on the show, every time I would drive in going down that dirt road, I'd look at that road off to the right that went up to that hill that we and myself and Willie had a, you know, bail out of the General Lee as it disappeared over the top. And I didn't know if they had ever found the car. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we, Tommy, he said, he goes, yeah, we found the, found the General Lee because there was an episode that uh, had a helicopter sequence and the pilot, Chuck Tamburo, was bringing the helicopter out there to Westlake from, uh, I believe it was from the Van Nuys airport. And as he was flying over, he looked down and spotted this General Lee crash into this tree. And he mentioned to Tommy, you know, he says, or questioned him, hey, how come you guys have a General Lee crash into a tree over there in the canyon? And Tommy's like, what are you talking about? And so they went and they found it. Um, but yeah, that was, <laughs> that was um, pretty, pretty hilarious. The look on Tommy's face when he found out that uh, I was the one who had stolen, in his definition, stolen the General Lee. I still to this day say I just took it for a joyride. Well, listen, I hope you enjoyed listening to my stunt stories. And and uh, if you'd like to hear more in the future, please consider subscribing and help me spread the word by telling all your friends about stunt stories. Thanks for listening.